Welcome to Tightlining Maryland. I am obviously not out on a stream today. I am actually kind of switching up the content a little bit and I'm going to start to mix some of the fishing as well as maybe, I don't want to call them tutorials, but one thing I guess I am going to call it is kind of a summer school, if you will, since I'm a, a teacher that's on summer break. I feel like I might as well be trying to help somebody to learn something. I know that when I first got into the sport, what I'm about to cover today was something that I wish I stumbled upon. It doesn't mean that everybody that's watching this is going to be into it, but essentially there's three main things that I would like to cover with you today. First is going to be the rod, and that's going to get broken down into a couple different things for you know what to look for and other components about the rod and the general setup. The next is gonna be the leader system. I think that's gonna be probably the most critical part of the video today. At least I'll argue that because of what I can do with it. Um, and then finally, the last thing is gonna be just a little bit about flies that I'm using on that specific leader system. Just give a quick rundown of like, what I use, how I use it, and why I use it. So again, today is going to be our first session of summer school, and today we're going to be talking about how to tight line nymphs. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is going to be the rod. I am um, in the, I guess you could call it man cave, but the man cave has in the last year or so uh, been taken over by the baby cave um you know life can get crazy when you have a baby it's awesome and i mentioned that in my father's day video but uh what was something that you know was going to turn into a man cave is going to have to be a mix of the two the good news is uh, my wife who um has been gracious enough to support me throughout this whole process of trying to get into fly fishing you know helping me to set up things like for example uh, my fly tying setup as well as just the actual station, which is where I'm gonna be working today. You know, she's been instrumental to basically, you know, making all of this possible. Um, so with all of that said, let's get into the first part of today, which is gonna be the rod, okay? So the rod that I use when I tight line nymph is going to be um, a Syndicate P2, okay? And that Syndicate rod, is something that um, is a 10 foot three weight rod. And just to give a rundown of rods, um, when I first got started, I was looking up you know, articles about it, asking people the tight line nymph, what should I consider? And the general consensus was get something that's about 10 feet, maybe 10 six. You can definitely go larger and get an 11 foot um, rod. I think there's some that even go 11 six. But the reality was I felt like a good base was gonna be a 10 foot rod for me and a three weight. You can get them in twos and that sensitivity is gonna get better. You can get them in fours and that's gonna help you to you know, basically be able to fight bigger fish if you're gonna chase maybe steelhead, you're gonna want a four, four weight at least um, if you're tight line nymphing. I know a lot of people use seven, eights, maybe even I wanna say like nine weight for uh, steelhead, but that's a whole nother conversation. I'm talking about the average guy that wants to get out on a stream, they want a tight line nymph for trout that might range anywhere from four or five inches all the way up to 20, um, you know, on a good day. So the moral of the story is um, I struggled with a 10 foot rod to begin with. It felt extremely awkward after only using, you know, eight foot and eight foot six rods. But this has really become kind of like, I guess, a second skin, um, if you will. So I'm going to encourage anybody watching this video to go with a 10 foot or a 10 foot six. Um, three weight is great. You know, I don't think a two is needed. I don't think a four is needed. A three is a nice intermediate between the two. Um, good sensitivity still on the three. Good enough backbone that I feel like I'm almost using a four weight. Um, so, you know, when I get into a larger fish, I can still put a lot of pressure on it. But other rods to consider outside of Syndicate, Cortland produces one. Uh, Orvis with the Recon just put out one specifically for, you know, Euro nymphing as well as Sage has one with ESN. There's a variety of options out there for you in terms of rods, but I felt like Syndicate at the price point of $300 delivered everything I wanted and more, and I didn't have to pay $900 for an elite rod, and I didn't have to maybe go as low as, you know, $150, $200 for one that maybe wasn't going to be as good a quality. The last thing that you need to know about the rod is going to be the line, and the line is actually the least critical part, I'm going to say, of this entire video, okay? So don't check out on me, but in the same light, it's not something you need to really, really know, because the reality is, if you're using the setup that I use, which is 
you know, I'm not saying my setup is the best setup. I'm just saying that it's something I've really taken to. I can go out on basically any stream and feel confident that every single time I'm going to catch fish. And there's no better feeling that when you step onto a stream, whether it's your home stream, a new stream, whatever, that you're going to go out and catch fish. So the reason why I say you don't need line is because my leader system, which is going to be the next thing that we cover, um, the leader system doesn't require that we actually use a whole bunch of line, if any at all. Um, so I'll get into that leader later. But the line that I do use on this is a Rio Euro line, and that line is extremely thin. That that line is extremely sensitive and very easy to cast. Um, if you use regular line and it comes out of the reel and you're trying to tight line, as soon as you like, for example, stick your arm out, which you're going to have to do for tight line nymphing, and you have regular line coming out of this reel, what's going to occur is that line's heavy and it's going to slide back in and then it's going to pull your leader system in with it. So that's why if you are going to be buying line, I would say it's really important that you get a um, specific Euro line, or you make sure that your leader system is longer than um, just average because that way you can use exclusively the leader system and maybe still keep on your regular floating line or weight forward line, whatever the case may be, um, and avoid having to use any line at all. So that's a cheap tip. Um, pay attention to the leader that we're going to talk about today to avoid having to buy some line. The second part of what we're going to be talking today about is going to be our leader system, which again is going to be the most critical part, in my opinion, of this entire process to make sure that you have a successful day and hopefully one in which um, is going to be relatively stress-free. Here is an image that I hope makes this a lot more simple and so that you don't have to like go back and rewind a bunch of times. So just to cut right to it, here's the image. So that image basically breaks down exactly what is going to be needed to make this leader setup possible, um, gives great variability to it. I'm going to give kind of a credit very quickly to Lance Egan um, because he created a video and it's called Dynamic Nymphing and it's got two parts. Part one is giving every angler the opportunity just to learn this basic setup. What I'm about to cover um, you know, I use very, very similar material, minor variations. Um, you know, I'm certainly not trying to steal his idea by any means, but I'm trying to communicate that like anybody that wants to learn more about this could certainly watch part of this video, but I'll never do it justice compared to the professionals and what they did. So I highly encourage you to check out Dynamic Nymphing, uh, part one and part two for once you really start to master the system. Um, they give a lot more specifics in part two that really helped me to step up my game to the next level. So here's what we got in terms of the setup, okay? I mentioned that you're going to need Maxima Chameleon 20, 15, and 12 pound test. You're also going to want tippet rings. Um, you're going to want indicator line or what's called cider line. And then finally, what I don't have up here, but it's connected to my bag, is going to be uh, tippet. So with that said, what you saw on the images, just to quickly break down, I want to take each one of these sections of the Maxima Chameleon line and I want a surgeon, excuse me, double surgeons, not them together at each point. And hopefully you saw that in the image. What that's going to do is it's going to allow me to basically have this leader system as long as I need it to be. So for example, I mentioned earlier that the best way to kind of keep this cheap and not have to purchase line, which could cost you 50 to $75, make your leader longer than just um, an average one. Um, just by a couple feet and what that will allow you to do is make sure only the leader itself comes from the reel All the way up through the guides and out the rod if you can do that You won't have to worry about line if you short this leader though You will have some line that needs to come out I typically have to be honest either none or maybe a foot to a foot and a half But the line that I'm using is that euro specific line and it doesn't pull it back through the um, the eyes or the guides of the the fly rod so to get into it, I'm going to want, as it mentioned in the image, five to six feet. I would err on the side of caution and go with um, maybe six 
because then when you double surgeon's knot, you're gonna be cutting off a little bit of both parts. Um, so inherently it's gonna be smaller every single time you double surgeon's knot and cut off parts. So I think six feet is a good rule of thumb. Um, I'll do that with the 20 down to the 15 down to the 12. So I'm tapering that leader down. So I have a strong butt section, but even that 12 pound test is really, really strong. I mean, you're not typically catching more than a pound or two trout. If you're lucky, you get into two, three, maybe four or five, but 12 pounds is more than sufficient. At the end of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a tippet ring. I'm gonna tie that tippet ring and be very careful when you tie those on. I've lost an entire, um, basically ream of these right off of there whenever I try to do this uh, foolishly. But uh, typically, just a quick tip on the tippet ring. Sorry for that terrible pun. It was unintentional, but it fit. So the point is, um, I'm gonna take that tippet ring and I'm gonna slide it down and keep it isolated by itself without opening the clasp, okay? What I'll do is I'll tie on the end of my, um, I guess, line for the Maxima Chameleon, the 12 pound, which is the end. Um, whereas the 20 pound is gonna be at the top going back into the reel. The point of the matter is, I'm gonna take that 12 and I'm gonna tie on this tippet ring isolated down here at the bottom. Once I've tied that in securely and knotted it, I can then take off that tippet ring um, off of this clasp and then what I can do is I can now tie in my cider and I'll tie that to that same tippet ring So I have the 12 pound uh, Maxima chameleon line tied to one end of it and then I have my cider line tied to the other I want 18 to 24 inches because it's bi-colored So what that allows me to do is I have on this one it's like a yellow into orange into pink type of color, um, if you will. So that way, depending upon the sunlight, one of those colors is gonna show up and some days you can see all all the colors, but the moral of the story is I need 18 to 24 of this because that's gonna be what's closest to the water. My edge of the, the um, cider line is gonna be on the very brink of going in the water, but typically not submerged, okay? So just to recap, 12 pound into the tippet, um, a tippet ring, and then I'll tie in my cider 18 to 24 inches of that. And at that point, once I have on my cider and <clears throat> it's connected to the tippet ring, I'm gonna take one more tippet ring and tie it to the end. So my cider will have tippets on both sides essentially, okay? So I hope that makes sense and you saw that in the image. Whereas my 12 pound Maxima Camellia has only got one um, tippet ring tied to it and the other end of it is double surgeons not into the 15. Sorry for the lengthy breakdown, but it's critical we get it right because if it's not right and it's not tied on securely, it's gonna ruin your day, all right? So off of the final tippet ring, so I've got my cider and then I've got a tippet ring on the very end. That basically is the end of the leader at that point, okay? From there on out, I'm just adding tippet, okay? And here is gonna be my, um, my suggestion as it relates to um, line. I'm going to advise, because um, I think it's worked best for me, I'm gonna advise to use 4X, 4X fluorocarbon line. I would advise that because the 4X is extremely strong, okay? 5X will still do the trick. Um, the higher you go, five, six, seven, um, the less strength you have to fight a bigger fish. And I know the smaller you go, what that means is the fish has a tougher time seeing it. However, to offset that, when you're using floral line, it's tougher for the fish to see. So you can get away with a little bit heavier line. So that gives you twofold advantage, stronger line and tougher for the fish to see. So 4X Floroflex by Rio is great. I've also been using um, by, I believe, Arc, and I bought it off of Lively Legs. I've been using a 5X fluoro-coated line, not fluorocarbon, fluoro-coated. And what that does is it takes a mono and coats it in fluoro, so it's tougher to see, but still has some of the same strength of mono line, which is typically a little bit stronger than the, um, the fluoro line, if I'm not mistaken. So the point is, I'm gonna take that fluoroflex line and I'm, I'm gonna use one and a half times the depth of the water. So if I'm fishing in, let's call it two feet of water, I need three feet of tippet. If I'm fishing in four feet of water, I need six feet of tippet. And most streams that you're on for this tight lining setup, they're gonna range between a foot to four feet. If you're really down in a deep hole, five, six, seven, eight feet, I don't think tight lining is the best um, for that particular setup um, in terms of like the body of water you're on. That's my personal opinion. I'm sure somebody could say, you know, I tight line nymph in seven, eight, nine, ten 10 feet all the time and have no trouble. Power to you. I haven't figured it out yet. 
I need to practice it and get better. But if you know how to do that, excellent. But if you're looking just to start out and you're on tinier streams or just regular river, river excuse me, that basically just go somewhere around two to four feet in depth, this setup is perfect. And again, go one and a half times with the Floroflex onto there. The last part that we're gonna talk about today, and this is part three of the video out of three, are gonna be flies. And what to use, not necessarily exact types, but most importantly, um, the sizes and what to pay attention to while having three different options that you can use on a stream if you follow my leader setup. I started using, out of the Dynamic Nymphing 2.0, a variety of three different presentations. All on the same leader, I don't have to change it one bit, it allows me to fish three different styles, all of which are very conducive to catching fish. And typically all of which, if I was using a conventional fly rod, I would have to change out different leaders every single time. I would have to change tippet every single time. Um, you know, I would have so many people that have, you know, defined the game of fly fishing telling me this is the way you got to do it. And you, you know, you have to make a change. And I agree. It is about changing. So let's jump right into it with the three different styles that we have available with this kind of mono rig. All right. So part number one, as it relates to uh, the first setup, the one that I use, I would say most often is going to be two different nymph flies. So with that said, I'll kind of show you a little Lively Legs day pack that I bought from them. Great, great little pack. Um, not too expensive when you think about the price per fly and it comes with a tacky box and tacky boxes are some of the best that you can use. But what I would typically do is I'm gonna use two different nymphs. So let's say for example, I pull out, and I'm just gonna take the same fly different sizes. I pull out a Lively Legs pheasant tail and then, which I just dropped that one on the floor, then I use a Lively Legs pheasant tail as well, but a smaller one. So the first one was probably a size 12, and this one is probably a size 14. Now, in terms of you know these nymphs, why do I need a 12? Why do I need a 14? What's it matter? You know, why do I have to pay attention to these things? I'm gonna tell you now, it's really important. Um, I wish it wasn't, and we could be a little bit less selective and just do what we wanted, but the reality is. As you saw in that image earlier, what's gonna happen is, is that I have the tippet, okay? Let's say I have that four to six feet that I mentioned before, okay? So I have my four to six feet of tippet. What I'm gonna do, which is really, really important, is I'm gonna double surgeon's knot another piece of about, I'm gonna say 18 inches, maybe slightly less, but about 18 is fine, okay? So I have, my four to six feet and I have my 18 inches. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double surgeons knot them and I wanna give a, a, an overlap and certainly look into videos on how to double surgeons knot. It takes a little bit to learn it but it's really not that hard and it's a great knot that helps you to use this. So the point is I overlap them, I tie in my surgeons knot and what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have a tag that comes off on both sides. So I've now mounted both of these lines together, my original tip at four to six feet and my um, extra tippet that's about 18 inches and I got these two tags. So I'm gonna cut one of these tags off and I'm gonna have now just one, all right? Now I know this image is terrible with fists and hands but I also had the image before so I hope that helps. But the point is, off of this tag I have two options. I can either go with a dry fly, which we'll talk about soon, or the extra nymph setup, okay? The reason why I like the tag setup is because it allows your smaller fly to more so free flow in that current. If I were to, as some people do, tie in my four to six feet of tippet and then I just put my first fly right here and then off of the bend of the hook, what some people will do is tie line directly onto the bend. I used to do that. However, I've come to find out that I like using the tag because it gives me better action in the water and I've been catching more fish. So that was something I did through trial and error both methods work, both will land you fish, but I really do feel like the tag option is better. Now, I mentioned earlier it's important to know the sizes. If I use a 12 and a 14, I want the 12 at the end of my tippet and I want the 14 off of my tag, okay? So that six inch extra overlap coming off where it connected, I wanna use my smaller fly, sometimes even unweighted, like for example, this one's got a bead head and the other one also has a bead head, 
but I want the smaller one to either be unweighted or minimally smaller. So if I'm using a 12 at the end, I want a 14 uh, off the tag. If I'm using a 14 at the end, I want a 16 off of the tag. You get the idea that we're gonna basically make it a size smaller each time. That's really important. Now, the next thing that we should be talking about when it relates to this same very setup, um, nothing changes per se, but let's say that I take now out of this box, let's say I take a dry fly, okay? And this particular dry fly is a beaten up, I believe, caddis. And this will be what I replace with my smaller, okay? Smaller um, bead headed nymph that I had on the tag originally. I'm gonna put this now on the tag. And what that allows me to do is I can fish dry flies and I don't have to change my rig. What's even better about using that is that now I can fish dry flies and it acts as an indicator. So not only might I catch fish on the dry, which here's an example of one that really, really got me upset. Holy moly. But if I use that dry fly, it acts as an indicator for my nymph that I have at the bottom. So off of the tag, I have my dry fly. And then at the very end, I still have my nymph. So the only thing I changed out was my smaller nymph that was on the tag, all right? Now, here's the one tip I need to give you in terms of that setup. Make sure that in this one, we work opposite. So for example, when I was using double nymphs, I said the tag needs to be smaller, use a 14, and then have a 12 at the end. That way when the, the heavier one is the end, it kind of keeps it on the bottom, and this one flows in the middle of the water column. It's gonna be the opposite now with dry flies. If this is, let's say, what looks to be a size 14. So if I'm using a size 14 dry fly, here's what I need to do. I put that on my tag, and at the very end, now what I need is I need a 16. So a smaller fly, a size 16, is what I'm gonna use as my nymph. The reason why is I don't wanna drag this, um, this dry fly, I don't wanna drag it underneath. And if that fly is heavier than my dry, it's gonna happen. Then I won't get a good floating action, the whole system's gonna be off, so pay close attention to that when you do it. Whether you're nymphing or whether you're using dry fly and nymph with the dry dropper, pay attention to the sizes. It will matter, it will make a difference for catching fish, um, but I've really fell in love on smaller streams, whether it's brook trout, wild brown trout, any of those situations, a dry dropper has been my go-to lately, but I still advocate for two nymphs. That's also a great setup. Here's your very last one that we need to talk about for this leader system. So I've gone two nymphs um, for tight lining. I've gone dry dropper. And the final one is gonna be a streamer setup. On my streamer setup, which is I still have this on from Father's Day. The very last cast of that video, I truly caught my best brown trout that you can check out, and I've just kind of dropped um, the card up there in the video for you. But um, that best brown trout that I ever got, and it was on a tiny little wild stream, I elected to go with a streamer. I used the same exact setup and made minor variations to my leader system off of the tippet. So all I'm ever changing is the tippet. The leader stays the same no matter what. So here's what I did. I basically, where the uh, tippet and the tag met, okay, where that tag's coming off, where I can use the dropper or the small nymph, what I do is I cut that section off and I go directly just to a streamer, okay? So now I still have the four to six feet, and if I'm in a deeper hole, I could certainly add some tippet, um, or I could just start with a longer one to begin with. It's really what you need to adapt to while you're on the stream, and you'll figure that out as you do trial and error. Every good fisherman, if they're paying attention and seeing what works, they figure it out. But the reality is, if I wanted to use only streamers, I'm just gonna take off of that tippet ring, a four to six foot uh, section of it. So if, uh, again, you know, one and a half the depth, I'm gonna match that and put a streamer at the end. I'm gonna dead drift that. What that means is I'm gonna hold out my arm and I'm gonna cast it upstream and I'm just gonna work that down through. I know this isn't the best like scenario in a basement to show you that, but when I get out on the water, I'll talk about that more later and try to connect it to this video in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, again, I go back to, as I mentioned, and I dropped the card up there for you. Take a look at how I casted that. 
and all I did was a straight dead drift right through there, and that brown trout came out from underneath of that, you know, undercut and that overhang bush, and he crushed that streamer. Look at the channel ahead, it feeds right into it, gives fish nice protection. Um, and I wasn't stripping it in like a lot of people would. It was a dead drifted streamer that required nothing special, and I kept it on that same very setup. So I love the setup for the versatility. I love the setup for the ease of how quickly I can change everything and not need to reconfigure all of it, not have to pay for all these different types of you know leaders and cut them down and change them out. Um, this has really kept the price down for me, which I know is most important if you're just starting out. But it's also most important that you know it keeps it simple while you're on the stream. More time fishing equals more chance of um, you catching fish. So the last thing we're gonna talk about here today in part number three is gonna be flies, okay? I have a fly box here. It's got a variety of different flies in it. Um, you know, what I typically use when I'm out on the stream, just to drop a couple different examples, is I would use, for example, some of these hair's ears, maybe what's called a sexy waltz. It's got a little bit of a tie-in with the um, dubbing. I might use a Frenchy fly Okay, I might also use things like, for example, these tungsten torpedoes. These are great. Um, I need to tie some more, but I have a tungsten surveyor right here. I mentioned that in the last video, how it's one of my favorites. I could use a red dart, okay? I could use other variations of sexy waltz. Um, pheasant tails are great options as well, but keeping it simple, getting it down to like, what I would call confidence flies, just like they're gonna say in the dynamic nymphing video, but flies that you go out on the water and you know no matter what the dynamic is or what the makeup, you know, chemistry is of the bug life and the, you know, the activity of the stream, I feel like these flies really put me in a good place to catch fish no matter the situation. So hair's ears, easily a go-to. Um, waltz worms, tungsten surveyors, all the ones that I essentially have mentioned here today, they keep it simple, they're easy to tie, and they're something that are extremely effective. Um, the Lively Legs box that I mentioned earlier, I've caught wild fish, I've caught um, stocked fish, you know, the streamers are, I would argue, the perfect size because they're not too big for maybe a brook trout to chase them, but they're also a good size for, as you saw in the video, a great brown trout to chase. Um, I'm not quite sure what size these are, but I'm gonna estimate that they're probably a size eight. Um, I'm not extremely familiar, again, with um, when it comes to streamers, the different sizes. The nymphs I'm really getting good at picking up the uh, size based on eye, you know, kind of gauge. But, um, you know, again, these streamers are not altogether that big. And I would say they're probably somewhere between a six and a 10, but let's safely call them eight. But it again, allows me the versatility to have different flies I'm confident in, different flies that allow for different presentation, depending upon what the water is like, and just flies that ultimately are gonna catch fish. Um, there is nothing better when you get out on a stream than catching brown trout on artificial flies that you've hand tied, um, moreover that you created your own leader system, you tweaked it to the perfect situation given what you got, and sometimes you're rewarded with a personal best fish, and sometimes you're rewarded with you know something as simple as you know a five inch native brook trout that you know absolutely annihilated your fly, and it's just got beautiful you know. I would say orange belly or pink spots or whatever the case is that you're looking for, um, you can do it with all the flies that I mentioned today. All right guys, so the last thing that I'm gonna say about flies, and I really also think that this is a pretty critical component, and although this isn't a fly tying video, this is just, again, getting you out on the water, how quickly can we kind of teach you what the setup is and make sure that you can maybe get out as soon as this weekend or within two weeks once you've gotten all the materials and you put it all together. But the reality is when I'm using flies that I've tied or ones that I'm purchasing, I really like using jig hooks, okay? And it really, for me personally, although again, in the comments you could certainly you know give some feedback on your thoughts, but. I think jig hooks are great because of the fact that number one, um, when that jig hook goes down into the water column, it's gonna put the hook kind of um, on an angle so that that um, hook isn't facing down towards the bottom but up towards the top. And the reason why that's important is it allows for less um, snags on the bottom. Doesn't mean you'll never get snagged, but it does mean that you know you typically have less snags. So 
<clears throat> these particular jig hooks are great. Um, the only thing that I should say about that, whether I'm using Orvis or a Lively Legs product, which is a little bit cheaper, so it's a little bit more cost efficient, but <clears throat> when I'm using those flies, one thing that's really important is I need what's called slotted beads, okay? So these slotted beads, what it does is it has a cutout in the bead itself and it allows for it to basically go around um, the jig. So for example, what I'll do is I'll take out one of the jigs off of this Orvis and just kind of show you really quickly what I mean. So hopefully this is gonna show up. So what you see there in the <clears throat> in the hook and just in case I'll show it here as well what I can see there with the hook is the hook's got a small little bend right at the top so it's not just a straight um, shanked hook okay that leads up to the eye it's got a small curve right in it right at the top so that slotted bead basically goes over <clears throat> that particular uh, curve in the hook and if I was using a regular bead it will essentially not work or not work well at least uh, might not even work at all if I'm not mistaken but the reality is jig hooks have really been kind of something I tie all of my flies on whenever I'm nymphing okay just to make sure I'm clear on that when I'm nymphing and tying on nymphs um, I use jig hooks I use slotted beads and I typically tie on size 14 um, as well as size 12 okay the last couple things that I'll say about flies to wrap this up, because again, it's not a fly tying video. I'll do something related to that later. Um, but the last couple things that I think are important with tight line nymphing, so just this basic setup, okay, whether you're buying flies or tying them yourself, you want flies that basically use lead wire to get it down deep, okay? So without going into great detail about what that does, but it wraps around the hook um, as you're tying on the fly and it gives it extra weight, okay? Um, you're already using weight with the <clears throat> the bead, but you can add extra weight by using lead wire and it's covered up by all the dubbing or all of the different materials on the fly. So it sneakily is like adding, you know, another bead, right? So the last thing is I typically like flash. So I have some ultra wire and I'll use that for a variety of patterns, whether it's gold, whether it's copper, whether it's silver. The point is I like having flash and that kind of you know, kind of peaks the eye of a trout, I think, or at least I'd like to hope that it does. Otherwise, I'm wasting money using it. But the lead wire is strategic to get it down, and the, you know, the ultra wire is strategic to give that fly just a little bit more pop. So that wraps up our session for summer school 101 as it relates to today's um, kind of tutorial on the setup that is needed to get out on the water and tight line nymph hopefully for you as soon as possible okay um, it was a game changer for me it took me a long time and a lot of different reading of web uh, pages and articles it took me a lot of watching YouTube it took me a lot of watching you know actual videos that I mentioned earlier today with DVDs but the point of the matter is Although this video is going to be longer than most that I do, I think, um, this summer, I felt like it gave all the information that I've kind of accrued over a long amount of time, probably the last two, maybe three years of trial and error and failures to being able for you to hopefully take it and you get started right away. So <clears throat> if you saw something in the video that you felt like, you know, here's how I do it kind of slightly differently, drop a comment. If you have a question as it relates to, you know, what did you mean by this? Or, you know, what if I made this modification? What do you think? Um, I'll do the best I can to answer it. I'm no expert, but I certainly feel like over the last few years, I've gained enough information with this particular setup that I could probably answer some general questions. But, um, you know, give me some feedback. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you want to know. Tell me if there's something you want to learn separately. Um, you know, if it relates to trout fishing and if it relates to, you know, tight lining, I am more than happy to kind of go into detail for you, um, answer your question and get back to you. That is the goal after all. The whole reason why I started this channel is my goal was to educate people that are learning um, to maybe tight line nymph and have done way, you know, other types of you know, ways of fishing, um, but want to get into this or somebody that's just starting off looking for an easy way. Um, you know, I really feel like this is a, a nice, simple version that allows for that versatility I was talking about. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Um, like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. And I'm very, very happy that, you know, over the summer I can provide hopefully 
I would say safely 10 different um, 10 different videos of informational things that I can help, you know, educate some people and still do a fishing video each week for you. That way you get a mixture of how to use it out on the stream and also what do you need to know before you even hit the stream. So thank you guys for tuning in. I look forward to getting out on the stream hopefully this weekend and getting you that video as well as some new content next week for summer school. So you guys have fun and tight lines.